If God created all things good, then what happened? experienced a, a situation where the description of something and the reality of something didn't match up. Yeah, I mean, we, we have that happen in life. Like, I, I always notice this in, uh, in like fast food places where you come in and like there's just this beautiful picture of like a sandwich and it's like three feet tall and, and like every, you know, and then you order it and, and what they deliver to you is this like this smashed piece of meat between two like pretty pathetic pieces of bread and you're you're like I literally had a friend once who like took it back to the counter and was like I want that sandwich like that the, the, this one and uh, you know because it just never seems to quite like the match up to to what they promise like real estate is another like uh, famous for this sort of thing, you know, where you get, if you're looking for a home and, and you get out and you sort of read all the descriptions and you think this might fit, this might be nice. And you get there to the house and what is described as a bedroom, um, unless you're sleeping standing up, it's not a bedroom. You know, there's, like there's these things that, that the reality, the description of something and the reality that we experience don't seem to, to be equal, to match up, to, to be in tune. Do you ever feel that way when you read the first two chapters of Genesis? I mean, we've spent the last five weeks together looking at the, the story of creation. And all along the way, as all of this is unfolding, it's, it's being described as good, even, even very good. Adam is, is in the garden experiencing the blessing of God. There's this abundant provision for him. He's, he's living with, dwelling in community with God. Everything is as it should be. But this doesn't, this doesn't match our experience. This isn't our reality. And so we're left with this inevitable question of what went wrong. If, if God created it all and, and he said that all of it is good, then what went wrong? Why does it seem so different? I mean, when was the last time you watched the evening news and said, well, that was fun. That was really, that was encouraging. Like there's so much great news going on in the world right now. Now, typically we're, we walk away depressed or angry we see stories and images of, of war and violence, of genocide and oppression, of poverty and, and corruption and abuse of power, of, of devastation from natural disasters, and, and the list goes on and on and on. One of the questions that any philosophy or any worldview or religion has to answer, one of the things that, that has to be dealt with is the problem of sin and evil in the world. Traditionally, then, the, the secular view has been to, to assign blame to failed social or, or political structures, to sort of avoid coming to the conclusion that, that the source of the problem is rooted in human nature itself. It's ultimately seeking to preserve the idea that humankind is basically good. The difficulty here, of course, is that the experience of sin and evil is a constant across every social structure and political system. Steven Pinker, who is a prominent evolutionary psychologist and a professor at Harvard uh, University, describes it this way. He talks about this challenge. He says the prevailing wisdom among intellectuals has been that evil has nothing to do with human nature and must be attributed to social and political institutions. But distinct patterns of cruelty and callousness come up repeatedly in human history, cutting across all times, places, and social or political systems. 
So Pinker, who is not looking at this from, from the perspective of a Christian worldview, is essentially acknowledging that the problem uh, of evil itself cannot be dismissed as merely a systems failure. Subsequently, then, political structures and solutions, government programs and social ideas and economic advances have not been able to solve the problem of evil and violence in the world. We continue to see that lived out. So a pattern begins to develop in, in our experience. The current generation will look at the previous generation and find fault in their way of doing things. They then believe that perhaps they have come up, they've discovered the solution to the problem. And yet, when all of it gets resolved, typically their solution only ushers in a whole new set of problems, and the problems that existed prior to that remain. G.K. Chesterton, who, who was a pastor in England uh, at the early part of the 20th century, so 100 years ago, um, wrote talking about this, and I think he aptly describes it. He says, I believe what really happens in history is this. The old man is always wrong, and the young people are always wrong about what is wrong with him. He says, the practical form that it takes is this, that while the old man may stand by some stupid custom, the young man attacks it with some theory that turns out to be equally stupid. I think Chesterton's right. I think he describes a pattern that we see over and over and over again in our experience and in our history. And all of this is why Genesis chapter 3 is so important. Because it gets at the root of the problem. It answers the question of what went wrong and why we see and experience so much sin and evil and disruption in our world. Genesis 3 goes beyond, however, merely acknowledging the existence or the, uh, recognizing the symptoms. It's one thing, after all, to, to acknowledge that there is stomach pain. It's something altogether to determine if the source of that pain is indigestion as a result of, of too much chili or if it is appendicitis. You see, Genesis 3 is, is giving us a diagnosis, and it says that the diagnosis is, in fact, terminal. It identifies that the reason behind the existence of evil and suffering is sin itself. And then, as we shall see here shortly, it, it speaks hope into that reality. Let's turn together to Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, as lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And then both of their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard a sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Let's pause there. Uh, the, today we are entering into a new series as we've been studying what we call the story of God. We, as I mentioned, we spent the last uh, five weeks um, looking at the story of creation. And now we begin a series entitled Paradise Lost that looks at the impact of 
of sin into this narrative, into this creation, this, this perfect community that God had, had created for us to be a part of. And when we come to a text like this, for many of us, there is this uh, tendency, I think, to say, I've heard this all before. Like, I, I know the script here, Adam and Eve and the garden and the serpent and, and forbidden fruit and so on and so forth. I know this one. But I, I want to caution us on this point. Because without an accurate understanding of what is taking place here in Genesis chapter 3, we will fail to grasp what is taking place, what is, what is unfolding in the rest of the entirety of Scripture of what is taking place in the rest of the story. We've talked about this series as, as we've described it as, as a look into God's grand redemptive narrative. And now here in Genesis chapter 3, we discover why redemption is necessary. Additionally then, Genesis 3 is so critical for us to understand ourselves. It's so critical in our ability to understand ourselves, our struggles and limitations. We cannot understand who we are unless we understand the biblical doctrine of sin. And it begins here. So let's take a, a few moments together here to, to process this text. And I want to begin by looking at the subtlety of sin. The subtlety of sin. Here in the text, we are now introduced to a new character for the first time, simply referred to as, as the serpent. The book of Revelation gives us further insight when it talks about the ancient serpent of old who is Satan or the devil. We, uh, uh, just by way of, of background here a little bit, Satan, uh, or, or sometimes referred to as the devil throughout Scripture, is a created being. He is a, a fallen angel. Genesis 3 is sometimes referred to as original sin, but there is a sin that precedes the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden, and it is the rebellion of Satan against God. Satan, according to Isaiah 14, sought to be like God. He, he in fact, desired to supplant him. And now Satan here is, he is repackaging this same lie. He's presenting it to, to Adam and Eve, this lie that ultimately led to his own rebellion. The text here describes this character, Satan the serpent, as crafty. The word crafty uh, means like shrewd or, as I said earlier, subtle. So he's coming at Adam and Eve and he does not approach them as this fearful creature. He doesn't come with, with horns in a in a pitchfork or the characters that we typically think of when we describe Satan. He approaches Eve with enticement, with uh, a, an attempt to disarm them, to, to take away their, their natural tendency to, to be careful or to be aware. Satan comes in this subtle, slow form. Notice the progress that takes place here in the text. And Satan's discussion here with Eve, it begins with a question. He says to her, did, did God actually say? Did he say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? It's, it's almost unnoticeable, but Satan here merely twists a couple of words. It's so subtle, and yet the, the deception is so clever. He, he says, see, because God never says you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. In contrast, God says you can eat of every tree in the garden, but you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or you will surely die. A couple weeks ago when we gathered together, we were looking at Genesis chapter 2, and we were talking about that text, this description of Eden. We were thinking of it in terms of beauty and boundaries. Beauty and boundaries. And we talked about how God is providing for Adam and Eve. There's this, this abundance that's inherent in the text. And, and yet how God's boundary that he places there in Genesis chapter 2 is just yet another way that he is protecting and providing for Adam and Eve. It's, a, it's another aspect of his provision. Now the serpent, by subtly just altering a few words, seek to shift their understanding to 
their perspective on God's boundary. From, from that of provision to the idea that God is, is holding out on you, that he's holding back, that he's, that he's keeping something from you. Think for a moment, if you can, about our own, like if we can be introspective here for a second, about our own struggles with sin. So often for me, if you are anything like me, when I am really in a struggle or a battle, I did not see that coming. The consequences and the experience of that did not come in the fullness of what that would ultimately do in my life. It came as a, a quick or an easy way out. It came as something simple or avoidable or something that, that was um, uh, just, just kind of more of a mishap or a mistake. That's the nature of sin. That's the nature of what Satan is doing here. He's coming at Eve with this, this notion or idea, this twist on what God says. The reality is, is that you and I continue to experience this in our heart, in our lives, all the time as we deal with temptation. What, what harm will this do? It's an innocent, it, it's a victimless crime, right? We don't come, nobody, nobody wakes up in the morning and says to themselves, I'm going to go cheat on my wife today. It happens over the course of time where things are not checked and the course and, and, and the development and the progression of temptation and sin and all of a sudden there's devastation in a marriage. And this is exactly what Satan is doing in the hearts and the lives of Adam and Eve. The coercion then continues here as Eve engages in the conversation. She gives her rendition of what God's uh, boundary was, what he said to them. She responds and says, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. I don't, I don't want to make too much of this here today, but Eve's retelling of God, God's command contains a, a, an addition. God never said anything about not touching it. So, so again, she's off just that little percent. This would have also, by the way, been a great time for Adam to chime in here. Because if you remember back in Genesis chapter 2, this boundary is set particularly to Adam. The, the, the order of things comes where uh, God speaks to Adam and then there is the creation of Eve, but Adam remains silent. So the progression continues. Satan now moves from a question to an outright lie back in Genesis chapter 3 verse 4 and 5 it says this but the serpent said to the woman you will not surely die for God knows that when you eat of it your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil Satan in no uncertain terms now to Adam and Eve calls God a liar he can't be trusted. He's holding out on you. He doesn't have your best interest in mind. He calls into question now the very character of God. Is he really good? Does he really love you? Or is he holding back? All of this leads then to, to Satan's ultimate lie. God knows that if you eat of it, you will be like him. He knows that if you eat of it, you can become like him. You are no longer going to need God. When Satan sought to deceive Adam and Eve, he does not attempt to call into question God's existence. He does not attempt to call into question God's power. He calls into question God's goodness. He calls into question his character. And this is what I find so unnerving about this passage is that it feels so familiar is is that it's so recognizable that the that the pattern of temptation that that is working itself out in genesis chapter 3 has been played out in human history and the human experience so many times has been played out in my history in my experience where i fail to to understand to recognize to acknowledge the goodness of God, and then sin has its foothold. When despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, I question his character, and in doing so, I ultimately exchange uh, 
truth for a lie. Satan doesn't come at Eve and, and make his ultimate purpose obvious. He comes with a question. He positions himself as an advocate in order to erode a fundamental truth. And that is simply that God is good, that he, he's here to provide for you, to give to you. This subtlety of sin now gives way to the seriousness of sin. The seriousness of sin. What happens next? And, and we all know the story. Adam and Eve come to believe the lie. And like all of us, when we believe it, we act on it. Adam's passivity here is, is negligence of his purpose. When, when God placed him in the garden, he said, you're here to, to guard it, to protect it, to keep it. Again, back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 and 7 now. It says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And today, for our purposes here, we're not going to spend a ton of time talking about the consequences of what takes place here based on, on Adam and Eve's sin. We're going to dive into that more next week as we look at the second half of Genesis chapter 3. But, but I want to take a moment here to look at and to consider the overarching implications of sin. And have you ever, have you ever read this text or heard this story and feel like, like God's overreacting. Like at the end of the day, isn't this just biting into a, a fruit? Which by the way, we also sort of see this tendency in our, our human nature, right? If anybody's a parent, you've definitely had a kid say to you, you're just overreacting, dad. I have kids say that to me on a fairly regular basis. Don't overreact, dad. And we feel that way. We, we sometimes think that way when we look at this text. Is it God being harsh here? Can't we get a, a redo or, or a mulligan? But of course, that perspective fails to acknowledge. It fails to understand the gravity of sin, of both theirs and, and ours. This text isn't about eating fruit. The seriousness of sin here isn't exclusively about the action. It's about what enables or motivates the action. This sin, like all sin, is a rejection of God's provision and of his promise. The existence of sin, the essence of sin, is not merely doing wrong things. It's not about breaking the rules. The essence of sin is distrusting God and trying to be our own Savior and our own Lord. There isn't anything intrinsically bad or evil about the tree. God made the tree. It's a part of his creation. As a result, it's called good. The problem here is that Adam and Eve come in their attempts to take a good thing and make it the ultimate thing. This is the seriousness of sin. This isn't a, a mistake or a mishap. This is, in fact, cosmic treason. In our efforts to place anything in our lives outside of God as, as central or primary, that is ultimately cosmic treason. The sin in Genesis chapter 3 here is primarily not about the fruit. It is rather the statement that eating the fruit makes about God. Again, I think this is true. We see this in our own experiences, in our own struggles with sin. And, and the root of so much of what we experience in our life comes when we attempt to take something, oftentimes a good thing, and make it the ultimate thing. So when I take a relationship in my life, and, and I look at that, and this is the source of meaning, or of joy, or of and I take that and I make that the ultimate thing. And it supplants that position in my heart that where God is to reside and, and it always collapses on itself. Always without failure. When I take success in my career and I make that that thing, it, 
It always collapses when I take pleasure and I make that that thing. It always collapses on itself. It's our own experience. It's the experience of Adam and Eve. We know it all too well. And we see in verse 7, the results are devastating. It shows us that Adam and Eve don't become more when they eat the fruit, but rather they become less. The lie now is exposed because life does not get better, it gets worse. But even here, in the midst, in the worst day in human history, hope resides. We begin to see that that from the very outset, the very introduction of sin, that God creates a solution to sin. That He creates a solution to sin. Back in Genesis 3, verse 7. It says, Then their eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Now it's gone from community and and. And relationship, God dwelling with Adam to, to hiding and shame. And here in the text, there is so much sorrow, so much grief, and yet there is so much hope. And the sorrow is, is evident to us. Shame has now entered the picture. The community that existed between Adam and Eve and God has been disrupted. The ability to function according to their Design has been eroded. There is genuine grief here in this text, and we should feel that. And we should feel that. But the story doesn't end there. From the very outset, what immediately follows the entrance of sin into the picture, into this narrative, is the pursuit of the offended, or excuse me, the yeah, the offended. Hang on a second. Of the offender. Nope. Of the offended by the offender. That, i got to rewrite that. Let me remind me of that. The one who was wronged is now pursuing the one who did the wrong. From the very outset, God is going after them. He does not abandon them. He does not leave them there. And this is the gospel. God is seeking Adam and Eve. This is the reaction of a holy God who is entirely good and completely loving. Pursuit is an indication of his love and his desire for Adam and Eve. He wants them back in relationship with him. I remember once my wife being asked by by one of the students that she mentored, how did you know that Sterling loved you? How are you sure? And I remember her telling this this student because it was obvious. Because every time I walked out of my class at Moody, he was standing out in the hallway. Every time I came out of the dining hall, he was there. Pursuit was an indication of my feelings. It was obvious how I felt about her because, because I was pursuing here. And here we see a God of pursuit. We see that that what is taking place in this passage will now set the trajectory for the rest of Scripture. We see it in in the pursuit of God in the rest of Genesis chapter 3, but it goes beyond that now. Because we will see this pursuit of God and His preservation of the people through Noah and his family. We'll see it as God pursues His people and He calls Abraham out of, of His land to set Him apart We see it as he creates a a covenant relationship with him. As he establishes his people called Israel. We see it in the provision of his law. God is pursuing us. We see it in the pursuit of, of, we see God pursuing his people as he leads them out of Egypt. To rescue them, to, to protect them into a promised land. We see the pursuit of God when he provides a Passover lamb, and we will see the pursuit of God when he provides the lamb of God. We see the pursuit of God for his people ultimately take him to the cross. With a penalty for death 
uh, that is due as a result of sin is now paid once and for all by a pursuing God. You see, the sorrow that is here in Genesis chapter 3 is met with the hope of the Gospel. Now while we hide in shame, a loving God pursues us. And it starts right here. Right from the very outset. As God looks for Adam and Eve. Would you stand as I pray to close this this evening? Father, it is a difficult... This is a difficult passage to take in because, because of what is disrupted, what, what was created and made and intended has now been broken by sin, and yet there's so much hope that's contained here because from the very outset we discover that you are a God who pursues. So may our hope be to be found in you. Lord, as you pursue us, may we respond to recognize that you are the one who loves. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.